Successful Stewardships, the name of the brief series that we're going to do. This is lesson one in that series and it's entitled Motivated Giving, Motivated Giving. I think as you all know in the work of the church, um, projects cost money. They come up from time to time, don't they? Uh, it's not if, uh, if we require funds to undertake a certain work or a project, it's more when uh, we will be called upon to give towards a special need or something that has to be renovated in our building or property or our vans. Or, you know, there's always something, there's always an expense in church work. Buildings need repair and renovation. New opportunities for mission work come before us. Uh, elders every week, they're always looking at uh, you know, presentations that are sent to them by different individuals raising support. And they're all good works, you know, some even better than others, opportunities. And once in a while they'll say, you know what, Let, let's, let's contribute to this particular work. We want to be involved in that. So there's always good works coming uh, before us. Um, I mentioned all of this as an introduction to the theme of this series, which is successful stewardship. I want to read a passage of scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul writes, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. I read this uh, to highlight the word steward. The term steward in the original Greek refers to one who manages or administers and the term stewardship refers to the thing which is managed. So in this passage, Paul sees himself as a manager in charge of the gospel message and its proclamation, uh, and during his time, its proclamation throughout the, uh, throughout the Roman Empire. He saw himself responsible. You know, he has this very important, very valuable information and uh, his stewardship is to communicate it as best he can. Uh, to the people of his time. Well, in the church, we're also tasked as stewards of the gospel and its preaching to our community, to the world. This is where the idea of money comes into play because the preaching of the gospel to the lost and the teaching of Jesus' words unto obedience to the church has a financial requirement. It's not free, you can't do it for free. For this reason, our stewardship of the gospel is closely tied to our stewardship of money. Okay. We read often, and we'll be looking at scriptures in the series, where Paul is receiving money. He's receiving gifts so that he can keep working, uh, so that he doesn't have to stop and earn his own living. Uh, so there's nothing new you know, that preachers uh, need money to support themselves as they preach the gospel. Uh, I believe that uh, good financial stewardship is necessary for effective church work because most church work requires money in some fashion. This then is the guiding principle behind this short series of lessons on successful stewardship because stewardship begins with giving and successful stewardship requires not only generosity but giving with the right attitude and we're going to talk about that. So motivated giving. If you were to ask coaches in professional sports what their main job was, they would tell you that providing motivation was probably their most important work. I mean, professional athletes, let's face it, they know the basics of their sport, they know the rules, they know the game. There are assistant coaches and special coaches who continue to work with them on these things. The pros, uh, you know, the professional athletes, uh, they're already in top physical condition and there are other trainers and personnel who help them stay that way. The uh, lawyers and the agents and the accountants, they keep track of the uh, star's money and uh, his career moves or her career moves. But the head coach is the one who sustains the motivation for a millionaire player who doesn't need the money or attention anymore to give his best, beyond his best, game after game after game. Even a uh, you know, multimillionaire athlete needs to be motivated. The money isn't enough after a certain time. And so with the right motivation, a mediocre player 
can be great. And a great player can become a star. And a star can become a legend. And the difference is motivation. When it comes to giving in the church, the same principles apply. It's not about how much money uh, we have. You know, a lot of people complain, you know, it'd be easier if we had a couple of millionaire members. You know, if we just had you know, four or five millionaire members in this church, boy, everything would be. I'm, I'm here to tell you that that would be the worst thing that could happen to you. I remember preaching for a, a congregation many years ago and um, uh, one, I won't mention the name, but one of the elders was a millionaire. He was a very wealthy uh, businessman and he was a good Christian man. I'm not going to speak ill of him. His contribution, however, equaled half of the entire budget. And he wasn't doing it to control things or whatever. He was wealthy and he wanted to give a good portion of his wealth to the Lord and so he gave it to the church. It just so happened that he outgave everybody by so much. Well, that was, that was fine. That was fine until two things happened. That was fine until number one, something happened in the church that he didn't agree with. Okay. And then that was fine until he left to be with another congregation. I forget what his business moved or something like that. I mean, just in your own personal life, imagine if you lost half of your income like it from one day to the next, a pretty dramatic fall. So that is not a good thing. That is not like, oh, I wish we had five or six millionaires. Uh-uh, you know, that's, that's, that, that, that's not the answer, let's put it that way. It's not also, it's not how old you are in Christ. You know, some people say that because we have a lot of young people uh, in our congregation, it's hard to raise a large contribution because the younger people give less. It takes a long time of living and experiencing God's providence and so on and so forth to have the confidence to uh, give uh, generously. It's not how big the church is. You know, others think that a, a church our size can't aspire to raise a lot of money because we're not enough of us. You know, uh, maybe we're not a big church like uh, you know, some of the congregations in town, you know, they can raise a million bucks in one day. So they figure, why even try? So it's not about wealth or experience or size. I say it's about motivation. If our group here uh, gives from the proper motivation, we can, we can reach whatever goal the Lord would put before us. And make no mistake, if the growth we experience is provided by the Lord, the challenge to provide for this growth will also come from the Lord. He doesn't give us something to make us fail. You know, he, doesn't, he doesn't present a challenge before us with the only purpose of, of ruining us. No, if he puts a challenge before us, it's for us to rise to it. It's for us to gain something spiritually and emotionally and physically from the challenge he puts, a, uh, he puts before us as, as a church. I think that's true as individuals, you know, as a family. The Lord doesn't put anything before us uh, for the simple purpose of harming us, always for our, our good. So the question arises, what is our motivation in giving? We all give to a lesser or greater degree, but each has a different motivation for their giving. Um, a Dr. Uh, Craig Hood mentions several giving motivations in his ser uh, series and book, uh, Giving That Feels Good. And I want to mention a couple of those that he talks about. The first motivation, common motivation, he mentions is guilt. Giving because of guilt. This is the I have to give uh, ideology. I don't feel good if I don't give. You know, I feel guilty if I don't give. People give because they have to give. The plate comes around, the special collection is announced, and they give because they will feel guilty if they don't give. Motivate some people. Of course, guilt is a strong motivator and it gets money from people who would perhaps not otherwise give. However, it's unbiblical, that's the problem. It's not a biblical motivation. 
Paul the Apostle says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 that we should be cheerful givers, happy to give, not guilty to give. Giving out of guilt may help the church get some money, but it doesn't help the individual grow out of materialism or selfishness or worldliness. It doesn't provide the individual with joy. You know, I mean, God provides opportunities for giving to give us the opportunity to have something good. And the good that should come out of that is joy or a stronger faith, not guilt. You know, when there's guilt, you know, the Lord is not the one doing that. All right, especially when, if you're doing something good and feel guilty about it, that's not the Lord that's you know, pulling those strings. That's the other guy. That's the snake that's doing that. Motivation number two, or another one that's mentioned, responsibility. This is the ought, the ought to give. I ought to give syndrome. This is the legalists or the perfectionists approach to giving. Giving is good, giving is biblical, and so I ought to do this. It's my responsibility as a Christian, a very mature thing to do. Again, the church gets money, but usually not a whole lot of money because a legalist's approach is to give what is strictly necessary, what's basic. Studies indicate, uh, uh, church studies on churches and giving, indicate that 20% of the members give 80% of the offering. 30% of uh, the members uh, give a total of 18% of the offering and 50% of the members give approximately 2% of the offering. I mean, that's not a you know, hard, fast rule, but in general, it, it kind of breaks down like that. This approach is better than the guilt motivation but again, it limits the amount of giving and the true reward for giving, again, which is joy and satisfaction. Actually, the responsibility motivation may lead to pride and complacently thinking, you know, well, I've done my duty. I don't need to do more, I, I did what I had to do. I had a responsibility and I fulfilled it. Check the box, move on. Motivation number three, need. I give because I want to give. God wants us to be concerned about meeting needs, right? In 2 Corinthians 8 verses 13 to 15, Paul says that God provides us what we have so we can provide for the needs of others. Knowing that there is a need often kindles a desire in us to do something about it. Not just the plate that goes around on Sunday, but sometimes you hear, you just hear in the announcement that so and so uh, had a premature baby, for example, and uh, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, expenses are uh, because of that and they need help and you, you, know, you feel, well, I, uh, you know, if that was me, boy, I'd sure appreciate the help that, I, that I'd be getting at this time. And so people give uh, out of need. Um, this is the motivation level that most of us are at. We see a need, we want to take care of it. This type of giving is satisfying, it feels good. It doesn't rely on guilt or compulsion to give, but rather it flows from a genuine Christian spirit. It also leads to sacrificial giving and it motivates others to give as well. It's also a way to raise money from those who don't normally give because some people don't give unless they see a need. Unless they say, I have, I have this rule of thumb here, but this is only a rule of thumb, it's not scientific, it's just having been to church every Sunday for 40 years, <laughs> you start to see patterns. <laughs> Especially if you're one that's kind of looking at the budget, you, know, you, you see patterns. So here's, here's my rule of thumb. If there is a huge crowd, right? If there's a huge crowd, you know when they say, man, the place is packed today. I couldn't find a parking spot, I had to park on the grass. Somebody's sitting in my usual spot. You know, I got to sit somewhere else. Even the benches down front, you know, uh, are pretty much taken up. The place is packed. When I see the church packed like that, I know that we will not make budget that day. If our budget's $10,000 a week, let's just say it's $10,000 a week, I, 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 you know, I'll tell you, we, it, we'll, be, we'll be fortunate if we get $8,000 that Sunday. There's this thing that happens because people give out of need. Well, they're looking around, well, they don't need my money today. <laughs> Place is packed, you know. 
let these other people, let these visitors, you know, fill in the budget. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always there. Just, again, I'm just saying, now I know, watch, everybody's going to be counting this Sunday. How many, how many? It's just a rule of thumb. It's just like when the preacher does a sermon about attendance, how important it is to attend church, to be at church. Don't skip, be there, be faithful, come to church. You know? I guarantee you the following Sunday, the attendance goes which way? Yeah. Down. And that's you, yes, so a preacher kid said down. He knows, he knows that rule, right? Yeah, the attendance goes down, why? Well, you're not going to tell me what to do. <laughs> not going to tell me what to do. It's just human nature. Um, so the downside of this motivation is that many times people, as I say, don't see or they don't agree with the need and they won't give. And this motivation is not you know, the most effective motivation because it's still centered on self. I will give for something that I see or something that I can relate to as necessary. There's still too much of me in that part. Another motivation for giving, and that is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving as motivation is the outflow type of giving. It's the I give because I can't help give attitude. This type of giving is giving as a way of saying thank you to God for all that He has done for you. Uh, this is the type of giving that responds to that. Paul said that his ministry was a reaction to all that God had done for him in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. You know, he said, everything I'm doing, I'm doing it because of what God has done for me. I can't do enough. What Jesus and the gospel has done for you, what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of you, what the church has um, done for you, makes you feel grateful to the point where you are motivated to give back. This type of giving impresses people outside of the church. It's what I call evangelistic giving. It also motivates and leads others in the church to not only give, but to be thankful in their giving. The only weakness with this motivation is that our giving is tied to our thankfulness. If we really appreciate the Lord, our giving is right. If we don't see all of our blessings or we're having a down day, then our giving shows it. You know, our giving then is a tie to our emotions. So if you're up, that's great, but if you're down, that's, that's not, such a good, not such a good thing. Okay. Number five um, motivation uh, is the worship motivation. Giving becomes worship when it flows out of one's personal relationship with God. Now you're entering into the area, you know, where, where, you know, where's, uh, where's he going with all of this? Where, where? I thought if you gave out of uh, gratitude, I thought that was pretty good. Well, it is pretty good, but there's better even. And, and we're looking at some of those now. When our giving occurs and is affected by our personal relationship with God, this is a highly motivating type of giving. When one's financial decisions are a result of prayer and fellowship with the Lord. When everything we do is part of our giving to God. Paul says that we should present, you know, I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God which is your spiritual service of worship. When one sees the giving of money in the same light as giving their confession of Christ or giving their trust in God or giving their lives over into His care, when one sees the giving of money to you know, the church, but you know, helping others, it's all part of the same attitude. Um, when this is what's motivating us, it's part, of our, uh, it's part of our attempt to give ourselves to God on a daily basis. Well then, uh, we've, we've, we're kind of getting into liftoff. We're getting into spiritual liftoff here as far as giving is concerned. When our financial giving becomes part of our spiritual relationship with God, then it becomes worship. It is motivated by a desire to honor God by what we do. 
there are no downsides here. You know, every other thing is, is human. And so there's a bit of a downside. But here, there is no downside here whatsoever. The motivation is God-centered. It brings joy to the giver and the church is blessed with sacrificial giving. Everyone is blessed. God is blessed or honored. We are blessed because of the way we give, the reason we give, probably the amount we give. Our brethren are blessed because they see what we're doing. Now there's one other motivation for giving, not mentioned by Dr. Hood, but included in the Bible. And it is a motivation that we cannot provide for ourselves, but is given to us as a gift. And that is giving that is motivated by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes if we are truly blessed, the Holy Spirit will grant us the gift of liberality. Romans chapter 12, verse six to eight, Paul talks about different gifts that people have, and some people have the gift of liberality. This gift is one where the Spirit enables a person to give without thinking. Now, do you know how hard that is to give without thinking? I can't do it. I'm telling you right now, God, the Holy Spirit did not give me this gift. Because I think about what I give, I calculate. I'm always calculating, well, how much is left for me? <laughs> how much will this hurt me? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think about it. And even when I want to be spontaneous, you know, and say, okay, let's do this. And then I think, oh, what have I just done? <laughs> but the, the Spirit of God enables some people to just give no second thought, no calculation. You know, no behind the scenes type of, type of stuff. To seek out, the Holy Spirit enables some people to seek out opportunities to give. People that have this gift, they yearn for more resources for the sole purpose of exercising their gift. I've said this before and I'm not embarrassed to say it, she's not in the room, but Liz has this gift. She has this gift, absolutely, right? I mean, uh, our children will say amen to that. She, she's going, hey, let's do this. I'm going, no, 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 we already, we're, we, you know, we've already done that. We, we, there's no money left, you know? And she says, oh, you'll see, it'll be okay. <laughs> she's that type of person, she has that gift. The spirit as direct motivator enables a person to give graciously and abundantly and regularly without fear, without pride, and without reservation. That's when we know that that person you know, has this particular gift. While for most of us, and I include myself in that group, giving is a struggle and a narrow road, and it's a challenge to overcome our flesh. The one with the gift finds it natural, easy, joyful, exciting to reach new levels of giving. Some people, the thought, the thought that every year they were going to try to give a larger percentage of their income to the Lord, you know, I mean, the thought of that would keep some people stressed out for the 11 months leading up to the new year. You know? <laughs> some people find great joy in giving. You know, we have a few of these people that I know of in this congregation who possess this gift, but I would not embarrass them, of course, by mentioning their name, except that one person I mentioned. I believe that God provides different gifts to different people in order to inspire all of us to give us spiritual goals to strive for in our development. We would do well to pray that God would bless us with this gift or bless the ones who have this gift with abundant resources so they can use it to the church's advantage. And many times you see some church, you know, they're building a multi-purpose building or some thing that they're going to use in their outreach or uh, in ministry that's very useful. And when you talk to the elders, how did you do that? What happened? You know, well, 
Sister Josephine you know, died, passed away recently, and when the will was read, she left X amount to the church to do this good work because she wanted you know, one more time before she passed away, one more time she wanted to be able to bless the church. You know? I mean, uh, Sister Josephine who does that, Sister Josephine was probably doing things like that while she was alive too, and just wanted to one last time to, to do something. And I've seen that happen many times in the church. You know, very, and it's inspiring to other people. You know, I've seen that happen in this congregation, in other congregations, but I've seen it happen in this congregation too. People give uh, very, very generously. And it's encouraged you. It says, all right, people believe in our mission. Very, very motivating. So if you're willing for this lesson to have a, a true spiritual impact in your life, then a couple of things you need to do. First, determine what your giving motivation has been. We're not going to get a, a show of hands here, you know. but you know, have you recognized? And the other thing too, it's not all cut and dry. Sometimes we give one, you know, for one reason, another time we give for another, we have another motivation. You know? But usually there's one of these five or six you know, that, that is kind of you know, standard procedure for us uh, in our giving. So let's figure out who we are, why we do what we do, especially in the area of giving. Number two, choose a motivational goal and ask God to lead you to this level by providing the motivation you need in your life. You know, we want, we, we ask God for so many things, but, but many of our prayers are for God to make things more comfortable for us, you know. Um, uh, we ask God to help maintain the status quo in our life because we have a good standard of living and we don't want to lose it. We ask him for that. And we pray for other people as well, that they be blessed. You know, we want our children to, you know, who, what parent doesn't want their children to do better than they did? Well, I think everybody, I've never met parents that didn't want their kids to be more successful, more prosperous than they have been in their life. And that's okay to pray for that. I'm saying, how about a new type of prayer in your life, in our lives? Asking God to make different kinds of givers out of us. Because remember, He's the one that provides the resources for us to give. And so you know, He knows when we're ready. But if we never ask Him, He doesn't answer that prayer. He doesn't often answer prayers that we don't make. So we have to make the right prayer. And I'm saying, why not direct some of our prayers uh, into the area of how and why we give what we do give to the Lord, not just in the plate, but I mean how we give of ourselves to our families, to our friends, and so on and so forth. And then the third thing, well, of course, come on back. Next week, we're going to talk some more about the idea of giving in this successful stewardship uh, series that we're doing. All right. Well, that's our first lesson, our introductory lesson to, for su successful stewardship. And the, the subtitle is Taking Good Care of God's Money. So we're going to be talking about that another couple of weeks. All right, thank you for your, uh, your attention.